You're listening to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran, and this is your place to explore the weird, the strange and unexplained, from cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Coming up on this episode is a discussion involving the very nature of reality itself, and it might just be a plasma universe. But before we begin, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you're listening, and definitely head on over to Apple Podcasts, and please leave a review if you like what you hear from this show. It's super helpful with getting the word out to more people. Well, I hope everyone is enjoying spring so far. The weather has finally warmed up in New England, and it warmed up pretty quick. There's no snow on the lawn anymore, which means getting projects done around the house, right? And I have a lot of projects to do this summer, and I'm, it's going to get me outside, I guess. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff that's been, been put off for a while, but it has to get done, I suppose. Although now it's back to April showers, it seemed... Like uh, it was hot for a minute and now it's back down to the moderate temperatures, but that's okay. I don't think I'm quite ready for a heat wave just yet. And I still need to get my air conditioners out because I have a attic office and it gets very hot up here in the summertime if I don't have the, the old AC cranking. <laughs> but I hope that you all out there are enjoying the spring wherever you are. And if you haven't marked your calendars for Monster Fest yet, that's going to be the first event that I'll be vending at this year, and it'll be good to see friends. So find me and say hi at my table if you're planning on going. It's going to be happening June 3rd at the Double Tree by Hilton in Canton, Ohio. There's going to be tons of vendors and speakers there like Lauren Coleman, Stan Gordon, Cliff Barrickman, Lyle Blackburn. Forrest and Scott from Astonishing Legends, Shannon Legro from Into the Fray, Aaron Deese from Hey Strangeness, Jeremiah Byron from the Bigfoot Society podcast, Amy Boo from the Olympic Bigfoot Project, and of course, Seth Breedlove, who is the mastermind behind Small Town Monsters, and a lot more. So I hope to see you all there, and it's going to be an awesome time, and it'll be here before we know it. And one final thing before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to give a warm welcome to a few new members of the Strangeology Patreon. We've got Brian, Colin, and Zachary. So thank you all so much for your support and signing up to become members. For those of you listening out there, if you want to check out the Strangeology Patreon, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. And I would appreciate it very much if you considered becoming a member to support the show. All right, so on to today's episode. I don't really have a lot of other updates at the moment. The last week was kind of grind time for a few other things, so didn't have a lot of other things going on be beyond that. But uh, this episode is a really cool one. And the guest for today is somebody that I never imagined I'd be interviewing. But I guess when you get into the podcasting world, people start reaching out to you. So my guest today is Professor Robert Temple, who you most likely know as the author of The Serious Mystery. And he has a new book out called A New Science of Heaven, Heaven as in the Cosmos. And this was just a really thought-provoking conversation. And the theories put forward in his new book about our reality is fascinating. So let's just get into it. All right. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Tonight we have a very special guest, the UK based Professor Robert Temple, who is the author of a dozen provocative books along with the international bestseller, The Serious Mystery, which is the book that presents the theory of the Dogon tribe in Mali in Africa, having knowledge of the star Sirius and having contact with an alien civilization that lives in that star system. It's a very interesting theory. His new book, which I'm really excited to talk about, A New Science of Heaven, might just be considered 
one of the most groundbreaking and seminal works in a new understanding of what the universe actually is and what humanity's place is within it. Beyond this, Robert has produced documentaries and written for a number of publications like The Guardian and Time Life. He's also a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, a visiting professor of history and the philosophy of science at Tsinghua University in Beijing, and he's been a member of the Egypt Exploration Society since the 1970s. So welcome to the show, Robert. That's a very extensive and accomplished resume that you have. Uh, can you give my listeners um, a little bit of uh, where where in your life did you decide you wanted to research and, and study all of this this subject matter? <laughs> <laughs> I often wonder about that, Jeff. Uh, I, I've been interested. I know that I started reading about all these kind of things at the age of 10, maybe nine. Um, so um, it was just an instinctive uh, uh, desire to look into strange things and uh, uh, the unusual. And, and I have a habit of looking for anomalies, things that don't fit. Uh, because I don't really believe anything anybody tells me. I always have to verify everything. And even then, I don't necessarily believe my own verifications. So, <laughs> uh, because I, I think that everybody's always wrong. Uh, most of them don't realize it, of course. And uh, that all conventional opinions are certainly wrong. And, and that it's almost impossible to be correct, actually. We're just yeah. too ignorant, you see, all of us, everybody. Yes, there's uh, so much that we don't know about the world that we live in. And there's still a lot of mystery, I think, in it. <laughs> but, well, you're doing your best with all your interest in Fortean phenomena, for instance, to look for anomalies and, and, and uh, try to uh, lift uh, the rocks to see what's underneath them uh, in order to get a, a more accurate uh, view of reality. So you're making a very important contribution yourself, Jeff. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, I, I too uh, found interest in in Fortiana and high strangeness since a very young age. Uh, and, you know, it's it's always been a fascinating subject to me. <laughs> well, we seem to be similar in that respect. We both were instinctively like that from uh, our childhood. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It seems to be a common theme with with people that I've talked to over the years about about this stuff. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your new book. One of the big elements and takeaways that I found going through it was plasma. What exactly uh, can you tell my listeners who may not be uh, as scientifically inclined? Uh what exactly is plasma and how did you come to the conclusion that the universe is made of 99.9% of this stuff? Well, the first thing I need to say is that there's two plasmas. There's the medical plasma, which people hear about in hospitals and it's connected with blood. And that's a completely different use of the word. So the plasma we're talking about is the plasma of physics. Okay. What is it? Well, um, it, it, it's a bit difficult for people to accept the fact, or maybe it isn't, that everything they were told at school was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not difficult for somebody like me, but most people don't really want to have to challenge absolutely everything they've ever been taught. But the fact is that we were taught, all of us as children, poor innocent little babes that we were, that the, uh, the, the cosmos, the universe is made of atoms. Everything is atoms. And of course, uh, it was admitted that there were indeed smaller things called atomic particles. But, but basically, you couldn't have a reality without atoms because we've got the calcium, we've got the silicon, we've got the carbon, we've got the oxygen. And, and that's it, see? So um, it turns out that's completely wrong. That, uh, and I didn't uh, myself invent this notion that the universe is made of plasma. All uh, astronomers and astrophysicists do know this. It's 99.9% .9 plasma and not atoms. Well, that's pretty shocking when you think about it, or even when you don't think about it, just to be told that, that the universe isn't made of atoms. It's made of plasma. And plasma consists of particles. 
running around doing things, uh, the electrons are negatively charged. And when they go along in a current, that is what we call electricity. Right. So we have, we have plasma going through all the wires of our house all the time, not to mention our brains, our bodies. And then the positive char uh, particles are called protons, and they run along doing things, but they're bigger and clunkier and heavier, so they are slower. And uh, the word for the flow of current of protons was coined by a friend of mine. Um, he called it proticity because it's protons. Electrons are electricity, and protons run along and they create proticity. I think that's a good word, but it hasn't caught on very much because it was coined by this a friend of mine, one of my very best friends who died long ago, um, and that is um, uh, Peter Mitchell, who won the Nobel Prize in 1978 for chemistry for coming up with this discovery that proton currents, proticity, which is a plasma flow, go across all the membranes of all the cells in our bodies. And so you've got the positive and the negative flows, the electricity and the proticity. And then the other constituent of plasma is uh, what they call ions, I-O-N. Uh, an ion is often re uh, re uh, thought to be a, an incomplete atom because it, it's not balanced charge. It's usually they're positively charged because they haven't got enough electrons, or at least what Earth-based physicists call not enough electrons. The ions are perfectly happy as they are. They do not wish to acquire more electrons. They do not wish to join the consumer society. <laughs> They're very, <laughs> very happy being rough and ready country folk called ions. Yeah. Well, fascinating. So it would seem that on a deeper scale beyond... The atomic and subatomic this is kind of what reality is constructed of which is very fascinating for sure there's always new physics it seems being found as as we go along and we have to kind of rewrite uh our understanding of everything that's right that's why i call my book a new science of heaven because that's what we need a new science of heaven in other words we need more plasma physics there are plasma physicists, not enough of them, and most of them are, are engaged in, in very specific uh, practical projects here on Earth, uh, not enough theoretical plasma physicists. Um, and um, I'll tell you two of the ways in which they are doing plasma physics at the moment. Every time you deposit a circuit on a microchip or a nanochip, you have to do it by uh, putting it down in plasma. And uh, so that is, of course, uh, commercially uh, secret, the different processes of putting a circuit onto a chip. Sure. Uh, is, that's worth big money. So all the people who are working in the plasma physics in such companies are under very strict secrecy uh, uh, agreements for obvious commercial reasons. And then the, the other major uh, area of research of plasma is this possibly fruitless attempt to contain fusion reaction, which can't be done in a physical material because everything would melt. And so uh, such things can only be contained by uh, plasma rings. Oh, interesting. Uh, which are called tokamaks. And they've been working on that since the 50s. And they haven't been able to just succeed yet. And we're well up in the 2020s. So who knows if they ever will. But uh, this in, this sucks up most of the plasma re, uh, researchers and physicists in this practical aim. So the kind of plasma uh, research that I've drawn on in, in my book, and by the way, it's a book for ordinary readers who do not know any science at all, <laughs> yes. not even one equation, don't worry, there's not even one equation to scare you. And the, the thing is, I do explain everything as you go along. Yes. And uh, I have many friends who uh, don't know any science at all. And uh, they said that they could understand my books. That was a very rewarding thing to be told because I struggled very hard to take this hideously complex stuff and, and explain it as if you and I are talking. Right. And so, uh, and I did do a, uh, an audio version of the book and recorded it myself. 
So the, the friends of mine who prefer listening to reading, they can, they've done that and uh, they, they all tell me they like it. So that's good. <laughs> so uh, what we need is more of this uh, research into what the real nature of plasma is without its practical applications being the focus. And a lot of that work has been done in Russia, G Germany, and America. Unfortunately, none in Britain, where I live, which is a great pity. And a lot of the scientists doing it are Russian scientists, strangely enough. And um, the most interesting work that pushed it furthest forward was by a very, very brilliant Russian professor who died many years ago now called Professor Tsitovich. Well, just to simplify, the plasma was discovered in 1879 by a guy called Sir William Crookes in England, who invented the vacuum tube. Ah. And he first encountered it inside his funny tubes, and he named it radiant matter and said it was the fourth kind of matter, that we have uh, gas, liquid, and solid, and then we have radiant matter. The name was changed to plasma in 1928 by an American scientist called Irving Langmuir, a very brilliant man. And, and my book is full of the, the stories of the struggles of the, the people I consider heroes of plasma physics, like Langmuir, uh, because they were all struggling against the ignorance of conventional thought and the establishment. But there's terrible stories of persecution, terrible, terrible. And I, I recount the human element of the struggle of all of this, which I think is very useful for people to know, because I'm not just giving a dry book about, oh, you know, you've got to know about this proton and that electron, not a bit of it. I tell about how difficult it was to figure all this out and to get anybody to listen to them. I'll give you one example. Um, in Up until 1962, you ask any scientist in the world, um, apart from the one I'm about to mention, what exists beyond the Earth's atmosphere? And they would say uh, empty space, what we call then outer space. It was completely empty, perfect vacuum. They all said that, and there's no use denying it now. It's like people saying, I was never a Nazi, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they were all science Nazis because they all believed that outer space was empty. and um, And so... Along came Fritz Zwicky, who was a Swiss astronomer. And he discovered evidence that outer space was not empty, that there was actually something there in what appeared to be empty space. And he, he, he wrote a paper and he couldn't get it published. No physics journal, no astronomy journal, no astrophysics journal anywhere in the world would take Zwicky's paper. For 10 years, he couldn't get it published. Hmm. And the head of the observatory, he just later discovered, had written to all the journals and said, don't you dare publish Zwicky's paper. And, uh, and so this, which was, of course, illegal. And, and so this kind of persecution, I'm afraid, is standard. What he did was he went to uh, a biology journal and said, look, I, I, I know I, I'm an astronomer and you wouldn't necessarily normally speak to somebody like me, but um, I've got this paper about outer space. And I can't get it published anywhere. And could I please publish my astronomy article in your biology journal? And they mm -hmm. said, yes. So then he got it published in a peer reviewed journal and he had his off prints, which he could send around by post to all the astronomers of the world so that everybody could read his findings, which had, he got around the suppression blockade after 10 years. And then uh, in 1962, he, which was pretty soon afterwards, that's just a few years later, he was uh, vindicated because the Americans sent satellites up uh, and discovered that there was all this stuff in uh, outer space and it wasn't empty after all. So, right. But it took 10 years and he was being called crazy because you're always called crazy if you don't what, believe what the herd thinks. Everybody who doesn't uh, join the herd is crazy. But that's what they always say. But it was simpler uh, back then because... It, they were just called crazy, insane, uh, totally demented, need to be locked up, put in, in, in a restraining jacket. Um, and, and and as a matter of fact, my friend Peter Mitchell went through 20 years of that, the one, the guy I mentioned. Yeah. And uh, 
And then everybody after, said after he got the Nobel Prize, oh, we knew you were right all along, Peter. And of course, they'd been insulting him all those years. And, and I have a friend who, when he was at Cambridge, um, and he's now my age, um, was told in, his, in the lectures, now there is a chap called Peter Mitchell, because he was studying this field of uh, um, bioenergetics, uh, who, who has various theories that are different from what we've just said, but uh, don't pay any attention to him. Whatever you do, don't read his papers, because he's totally mad. And uh, you know, we none of us um, even speak to him. And then he ended up getting the Nobel Prize for being correct. But of course, he had to be crazy because he didn't go with the herd. And everybody who's not in the herd is crazy. So you and I are crazy. I can tell immediately, looking at you, Jeff, that you don't <laughs> do everything you're told. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. It seems like you know, if you if you go against the grain, you know. The grain's going to try and push back on you for sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, the next thing I want to get into, and you're mentioning that outer space isn't empty. There's obviously, you know, stuff in the vacuum. It's not a perfect vacuum. You talk about this two cloud system that's just outside of Earth. Can you talk about this, this two cloud system? Absolutely. And uh, our solar system is full of what's called the solar wind, which is uh, plasma spewing out from the sun, because the, the sun is completely plasma. And all the stars are completely plasma. And lightning is plasma. plasma. So, um, so now that you asked about two clouds, well, you've, you've got one of the most shocking discoveries there. Because in 1961, there was a Polish astronomer an observational astronomer called Kazimir uh, Kordolevsky, spelt with a K. And um, he was looking at the sky as such people do, you know. And he he said uh, to himself, I'm sure there's some kind of cloud there. Things aren't right. Now, he, he discovered these two clouds, which weren't emitting any light, so you couldn't see them in that way, and were largely transparent. But you needed very sensitive equipment. And uh, anyway, he he said he published a paper saying that these clouds, two clouds existed between the Earth and the Moon. Big clouds, very big. And they are now, they came to be called the Kordolevsky clouds, named after him. And uh, then the Polish government was upset and told him to stop work, and he wasn't allowed to continue practicing as a science scientist anymore. His great-grandson has told me that. So then, um, in 2019, these clouds were confirmed by some Hungarian astronomers. I heard about it because they, they published their, uh, res their paper on uh, researchgate.net, which is a website uh, w uh, where I have my own technical papers and they have theirs. And, and most scientists and a lot of scholars and historians and, and uh, people of that sort stick their stuff. And I, I uh, plead guilty to being in that crowd. And so um, that's how I was able to contact him, because if you're in ResearchGate, you can contact somebody else's in ResearchGate with a message. So you don't have to look up their phone number or try to discover their email address. So I, I sent a message by ResearchGate to this woman who was the head of the team. And I congratulated her for confirming the existence of the Korolevsky clouds. Uh, because that was a, a big feat, but she used the kind of more modern equipment that we have today to do that. I said, because I instantly realized they had to be plasma clouds, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, are you studying the plasma aspects of these clouds? And she replied saying, no, we're studying the celestial dynamics aspects, that is how they move and form and so on. And she didn't appear to me to know what I meant. So I, so I gather from that she didn't know that much about plasma. It was instantly obvious to me as soon as I knew that these clouds had been confirmed that they had to be what's called dusty complex plasma clouds, which is a very specific kind of plasma. It's the only really interesting form of plasma. Now, plasma can exist as a gas, as a liquid, as a solid, and as crystals, or all at once in a plasma entity. And there are blobs of plasma 
which are called plasmoids. And every time there's um, stuff spewed out of the sun coming to the earth, um, which they call a mass ejection, um, it's in, in fact, it's a plasmoid. And it, it's surrounded by a sheath that protects it, a double layered sheath, which is very like the double layered sheaths that surround all the cells in our bodies, which prevents it being destroyed. And you can have plasmoids inside a big plasma cloud, which are completely different inside from each other, very hot, very cold next to each other. But because they're surrounded by sheaths, they don't affect one another. So these clouds, which uh, our goddaughter, Lily Ashley, has called the brain clouds, which I think uh, is good. You'll see why in a moment, uh, are together 18 times the size of the Earth. And they're between the Earth and the moon. Interesting. This means that we don't have an Earth-Moon system. We have a two-cloud system, and there's an Earth and a Moon thrown in, <laughs> which changes our view of things a bit. Yeah. Now, we don't look through the clouds to see the Moon because they're between us and the Moon, <clears throat> but not in direct line of sight. <clears throat> they're 60 degrees to the right and 60 degrees to the left at very specific points in space called L4 and L5 which are L for Lagrange, uh, which are points where the, uh, he was a famous scientist, where the gravity of the moon and the gravity of the earth balance out so that you can sit there and you can sit there forever if you like. Uh, right. you, you won't be drawn to either body. And that's where these clouds are based. That is their centers are because they're enormous. And now, knowing that they have to be dusty complex plasmas, we come back to the man I mentioned called Professor Tsvitovich, the Russian guy. Yeah. He proved, along with his colleagues in the laboratory, that dusty complex plasmas, because you have to have the dust in them or, or it doesn't work, can be so complex uh, that they're, they're known as dusty complex plasmas, uh, which can only be described by what's called nonlinear equations, which are very difficult to solve. And um, they're not like other plasmas. And they would fill outer space. And so they would um, be able to develop uh, by self-organization. They can develop intelligence in the end. They can, it's a, called the process of, of emergence. And um, they self-organize. Nobody makes them do that. Um, they do it to themselves. And they keep getting more and more and more and more complex. And he was able to observe intelligent behavior from these plasmas that he created in the lab, which had the dust in them. And, and so you extrapolate the, the he said, it's, it's essentially life, that you can have inorganic life forms. You don't need to be made of atoms. You can have inorganic, intelligent life forms. He had them in the lab. So you can imagine what... Uh, Two clouds, each nine times the size of the Earth, um, right next to the Earth, practically, between the Earth and the Moon, uh, that are so gigantic and have been there for billions of years. They must be so super intelligent. That's why our goddaughter calls them the brain clouds, because we think that they must have um, super intelligence, like super AI, but super, 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 hyper, hyper, hyper AI, if you can even imagine that along with the most gigantic computing power that you could ever conceive, so that they would, since they've been here for billions of years, they'd know the whole history of the planet. They'd know everything about uh, on it, every creature on it, and they'd be watching us, uh, talking, and they'd be monitoring everybody and everything, you, you know, the, the spy agencies. Uh, on, uh, they're not even a speck of dust compared to uh, these clouds, you know, all these great computers in Utah and all that, which are supposed to record all the phone conversations and all the emails and all that, that's absolutely nothing. It's absolute, uh, it's dwarfism compared to what the computing power of these two giant intelligent clouds must be that are right near the earth. Yeah, that's, um, that's pretty uh, world breaking, I would say that's <laughs> a very interesting, uh, thought. Um, and so it's, it's suggested that these clouds could be sentient and hyper intelligent. That's, um, a, definitely big, <laughs> hard to well, put words to it. Yeah. Even bigger is the sun. 
Because yeah. the sun is 300,000 times the size of the earth. And it's almost certainly intelligent. Yeah. In other words, those two clouds would be little minnows compared to the sun, probably agents of the sun. I, I think that the sun is conscious. And um, this is something that ancient peoples naturally intuited, because after all, life comes from the sun. That was obvious. And so they thought, well, maybe the sun is, is God, or, or we'll, we'll say that the sun is God, and they would be sun worshippers. Well, right. no, I'm not encouraging everybody to do that. Um, I did have a crazy uh, cousin who um, used to worship the rising sun, and she'd bow down and, and worship the rising sun every morning. Uh, true, true story. She she was, of course, I'm calling her crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. But she was peculiar in other ways. But the fact is that um, all the stars are probably intelligent, living, inorganic, intelligent entities. Yeah, that would follow with that logic. And, yeah. And, and so you add that together, then the galaxy would be even more intelligent. And then there's many galaxies. So you end up with the universe, don't you? And yes. uh, the universe is probably alive. I think the universe is alive and is the ultimate entity. Now, you could call the universe God, and I don't think that would be a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, you suggest that in your book that these Kordaliski clouds may account for uh, certain human experiences, whether uh, from plasma phenomena or entities that may have inspired uh, religions around the world. Can you speak to that idea? Yes. Uh, I, I'm convinced that uh, ancient, ancient peoples who lived in a quieter world uh, and who uh, were able to concentrate a bit more, get away from all the noise, they didn't have traffic, they didn't have uh, cell phones. <laughs> Thank God, <laughs> I don't have a cell phone, and uh, they were able to uh, think more deeply and and do uh, um, profound meditation. And I think that they were receptive to perhaps uh, you could call it waves of uh, inspiration coming from above, as it were. Uh, we, we don't know exactly how that would work, but I think that a lot of the ancient wisdom was genuine although it couldn't be justified rationally or scientifically because they hadn't worked that out yet. Nice. I think that modern, modern science is reaching the stage where it can now confirm a lot of ancient wisdom and has done already. Right. So I, I think that, for instance, Moses and the burning bush, which I discuss in my book, uh, is a perfect example of a plasma ball um, with, a, with a, a voice coming from it, which was... Um, uh, sent to Earth by a higher entity, uh, and I, I, because I also do a lot of ancient things, and I, I started out as, a, as an Orientalist with Sanskrit, and I, I know ancient languages and things like that, and so, uh, and I've written a lot of books about ancient cultures. Um, I, I study these things a lot, and therefore, uh, I, st I was able to de deal with the, the textual variations of the. Uh, account of Moses and the burning bush and, and um, point out what the, the theologians sort of know, but they never say uh, that the, the text actually says that the angel of the Lord spoke from the bush, not the Lord spoke from the bush. That's a very key mm -hmm. because then you want to find out, well, who is the angel of the Lord? So I did a lot of research and I discovered that his name was preserved not by the uh, the mainstream Jews, but by a Jewish sect called the Samaritans, who lived up in the north of uh, of what is today Israel, and they were enemies of the Jerusalem Jews. They didn't speak to each other. They didn't like each other, and there were good reasons for that, which I won't go into in a brief chat like this. But um, they preserved the name of the angel of the Lord. They called him Metatron. Well, now, that's interesting in itself, Metatron. And because I should say that I have a chapter about all this in my book, but if you want the full story, you have to see the footnotes, which are very lengthy passages that were taken out of that chapter and stuffed at the back because um, the editors thought that this is too much and it will stick it at the back of the footnotes and the people who are really keen will read that. So then I discovered 
something else about Metatron. This is the really, really hair-raising discovery. There was a Gnostic sect called the Marcosians. And um, they said that there were two gigantic entities above the atmosphere, uh, between the Earth and the Moon, one of whom was called Metatron. Interesting. Figure that one out. And this is all facts. These are facts which I've unearthed about ancient traditions. Make of it what you will, but it looks like the pieces of a puzzle are coming together here. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) That's pretty uh, hair-raising indeed. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Wow. That's pretty pretty wild for sure um yeah i um i don't do normal yeah no for sure me neither <laughs> um i i i was wondering about how gnosticism ties into this this whole idea can you talk about uh to that to what end yes well, I believe that the Gnostics, they considered themselves to, to be pursuing what they call the religion of light. And if you read the Gnostic texts that were uh, discovered at Nag Hammadi, and I've got a complete set of those with the Coptic on one side and the translation on the other. Um, so I've studied them very, very closely. And of course, you can never study them closely enough because it's so fascinating. But they're full of light imagery and fiery balls and plasma phenomena. And I cite a lot of those in the book, but there's too many to list. It just goes, it's all full of plasma. And the book of Enoch is another example. And I discussed the book of Enoch because Enoch is this prophet from the Old Testament who is taken up to heaven and he goes into uh, a, a realm of plasma, which he describes. And then, and even uh, some of the um, statements attributed to Jesus, which are not actually in the canonical Bible, say that uh, I think that he makes a statement to the effect that uh, the Lord is um, 10,000 times brighter than 10,000 suns. Work that one out. So what was he talking about and where did he get these numbers from? And and so... um, if you look into the origins of Christianity, the different uh, versions of Judaism before it was homogenized uh, in the uh, in the 200s uh, by the codification called the Mishnah, if you look earlier than that at, at what was underground in Judaism, which survives in a form of the Kabbalah uh, people today, um, I would say that the theology of the Orthodox Jews who are um, uh, Hasidim, um, they they may look strange because of the way they dress and their hairstyle and, and so on. Um, I, not much of which I per- personally find very congenial at all, and I don't think it does them any good in the, in the uh, perceptions of them by others. But I would say that theologically they're more accurate than the uh, what uh, Gershom Sholem, whom I was fortunate to know, uh, called politely the um, normative rabbinical Jews, which is, I mean, you've got different forms of them too. You've got the reform ones. And so I, I can't go into a long discussion about Judaism, but Judaism is not and never has been uniform. There are variations. And, and what interests me are the ancient variations. Gotcha. Okay. Huh. Um, so going back to, I'm wondering about these, these clouds that could be tied to biblical, uh, angels like Metatron, who, Mm -hmm. from my understanding, is kind of like the voice of God. These would be kind of, if they're hyper intelligent, they could be, repositories of knowledge maybe not all knowledge in the universe but probably a lot would there be a way for us to potentially communicate or access uh this kind of knowledge um you people speak about the akashic records and being able to um access them that way i'm not sure if these are related 
I think the Akashic Records are in the Korolevsky clouds. Hmm. Okay. And that they do exist. And that what people have intuited all these ages is, uh, is going to be shown effectively all to be true. It's just that it seemed perhaps a bit nonsensical to what the hard-nosed realists, uh, as that people often style themselves, they think they're being very rigorous and um, hard-nosed and, and realists and, and so on. I don't think that hard-nosed realism is what it's cracked up to be. You have to be more open. Yes, absolutely. Um, anything's anything's possible. I think. <laughs> always, always good to look at the world with open eyes and an open mind, for sure. Now, in the book, I, we've talked about obviously these these clouds, these Kordalisky clouds, are highly intelligent. But there was one one bit that I found super interesting, which was th- that it was mentioned that they can twist into kind of like double helix patterns that are called Birkeland currents. And the implications of that are really fascinating. Can you expand on that thought? Well, yes. The um, Birkeland currents are named after a famous Norwegian scientist called Christian Birkeland. Uh, who studied the aurora borealis, who went up and spent a lot of time near the North Pole and um, got uh, freezing cold. And uh, he he sorted out what the aurora was. And so um, the, uh, the, the they carry uh, electric uh, currents and can do so at superconducting speeds with no resistance over fast distances. And there is something called the electric universe theory, uh, which I think is sound, which says that uh, the the universe functions by means of currents uh, between the stars and so on, forming this cosmic web so that the filaments that you see in the photographs of the cosmic web that you that they print these days from the powerful telescopes, those are Birkeland currents. And some of them are gigantic, you know, they could be a hundred light years long and they can be uh, wider than our solar system in width, carrying almost uh, in- incredibly inconceivable currents between the stars. So what this means is that the the sun, for instance, is not powered by uh, a fusion explosion at its core, which was a theory uh, originated uh, in the 1920s from Sir Arthur Eddington, who did his best at the time. I'm a great admirer of his, but I don't subscribe to that particular theory. Um, it was the best he could come with then, come up with then. And so um, the the electricity is coming in at the pole, and which is negative charge and is pushing out the positive uh, charged protons and positively charged ions, which form the solar wind, which fill the entire solar system. So the entire solar system is actually part of the sun. You, you know, I have a chapter called The Cold Sun in the book where I explain that the closer you get to the sun, the colder it gets. It's the opposite of what you would expect. And if there was some sort of hydrogen bomb type thing going off in the middle of the sun, that would not be the case. Uh, the, the sun is surrounded by something called the corona, which can have temperatures up to 20 million degrees and more, maybe 30, maybe 40, who knows. Um, but uh, once, once you're inside the corona, which is very, very far from what we call the body of the sun, uh, you go down through something called the chromosphere, and then the temperature keeps dropping. And then you finally you would reach the surface of the sun, as we call it, anecdotally, because it's not a solid surface, but it, it's the bit with all the bubbly bits and, and things spewing out of it that looks very angry and very, very, very dangerous and not where you would particularly want to go. Right. Well, by the time, when you get there, you've dropped from 20 million degrees down to 5,500 degrees Celsius. That's all. But it gets uh, even worse because if you go down a sunspot hole, that we don't know where they end up, um, we can remotely determine these temperatures. Um, the temperature plunges to 3,900 degrees. 
So the closer you get to the center of the sun, the colder it gets. How, how can we, it can't be a fusion explosion. And even the, the standard physicists who can't break away from the herd admit that it would take 200,000 years by a process called convection for the energy of a fusion explosion to reach the, the, the surface of the sun, the technical name of which is photosphere. And, um, and then it would, you'd have to have a lot of neutrinos coming out. And, and so there are not enough neutrinos coming from the sun. So a lot of people agonize about this and uh, uh, they say, oh, well, you know, our theories might be wrong. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, please, 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 God, don't let our theories be wrong. But, um, but the fact is that there's nothing more painful to a conventionally minded scientist than to have to abandon a theory. Oh, chuckaroo. But the fact <laughs> is that all theories are wrong by definition because they're just theories. Right. But you see, they, they, don't, they don't really believe that. In their heart of hearts, they believe that their theory is their truth. It's like trying to discuss science with Meghan Markle. Get it? <laughs> She's got her version and everybody else is wrong. That's what a conventional scientist is like. Yeah, yeah. The true nature of science is to always question and be able to adapt with new information, right? <laughs> you got it. Yeah. But who does it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the electric universe theory is interesting. I was wondering uh, if you could um, provide some some insight on like the holographic universe idea, this theory. Does this kind of tie in to something like that? It is possible that the holography comes into this. I I, um, I admire all the attempts to describe a holography as being part of a description of reality. Uh, in order to see how where it would really fit, you need to know about the dusty complex plasmas and how fantastically complex they are um, in, in in their interior structure. So if you take a plasma entity that's the same size as as you. Jeff, and um, and examine its interior, assuming it's a, an intelligent entity, not as intelligent as you, but you know, getting towards <laughs> that. Right. Uh, if in, its interior structure would be more complex than your your physical body's an, an, anatomical interior structure. That and so you might say, well, how's that possible? It's because you would have nodes uh, connected by filaments. It would look very like the human brain, and um, the the uh, plasmoids uh, would be like the nodes, and the Birkeland currents, the miniature ones, uh, would connect them with each other. And the idea of superconductivity in organisms um, was published in the, back in the 1970s. And um, in fact, that's how I was able to discover uh, what happened to the, uh, the, the files that were seized by the FBI of Wilhelm Reich. Do you know who I mean? Uh, I'm not familiar, actually. Wilhelm Reich was a, a, a renegade scientist who had theories of what he called orgone energy coming from the sun. Ah, okay. And he, and he wrote about um, uh, orgasms in humans, well, and in animals. Um, he said that uh, an orgasm was a, a spontaneous uh, contraction and expansion of the plasma uh, of the human body. And that it was only indirectly related to sex. It was it was, had been linked up to sex to encourage people to have sex, but huh. it itself was not sexual. And um, so uh, he his he was the leading disciple of Sigmund Freud in Vienna. He ran Freud's clinic for him, and in the 1920s he published a book in German called The Function of the Orgasm which got people quite upset because they didn't have orgasms in Vienna in those days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to. And so um, then what happened was the Nazis came along and they did not like Wilhelm Reich one bit and they burnt all his books. Yeah. And he fled Austria and went to America where he thought he'd be safe up in the remote uh, fastness of Maine. And, uh, what happened was the FBI uh, went up to his laboratory and his house in Maine. They took all his things he built, various models of things, and smashed them up with axes in front of him. 
they they took his entire library and burnt all of his books in front of him. In other words, the Gestapo had burnt his books in Austria and Germany, and the FBI burnt the same books in the United States. Now we're wow. Out. Wow. But they then seized his papers, all his work, yeah. his manuscripts and everything, and they disappeared. And nobody ever knew what happened to the files of Wilhelm Reich that were seized by the FBI. And this was in the 60s. And so uh, I was able to find them. And, and the only way I was able to find them was because I had read the papers published in the 1970s about superconductivity in the human body electricity going through without resistance because they were written by a man called freeman cope and i remembered his name and when i came across his name in preparation preparation for my present book i discovered that he'd published another set of articles which i'd never seen before which were to do with uh things that he could only have known about from the seized papers of reich and he uh, he worked for the um, Office of uh, uh, Research of uh, U.S. Naval Intelligence. It, it used to be that the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force each had their own intelligence services, and they each had a scientific department, but the Army didn't do very much. But the Navy were the most advanced, and the Air Force were always in com competition with them. So Freeman Cope was working for the naval ones, who were the most advanced, and he was their resident genius. He died mysteriously rather young. Uh, I may be that people didn't like what he was publishing, um, but um, or maybe he was ill. I don't know. You can't get any information about him. You won't find him on the internet. And uh, he, because he's uh, secret, you see, everything's secret, isn't it? But because I read the papers, uh, it was obvious, and he was referring to the, 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 the work done by Reich, it was obvious that the FBI had handed, they didn't know what to do with the papers of Reich. They just, they seized things, but they don't know what to do with them. But they gave them to the, the brightest of the uh, the secret uh, intelligence research people. That's before DARPA was created. And, um, and that was the U.S. Naval Intelligence people. And they didn't know what to do with all this crazy stuff. But because Freeman Cope had already been publishing pretty crazy articles about superconductivity in the body, and he was their most way out man and a genius. They thought, well, let's see what Freeman can make of all this. And my God, he made a lot. Um, and I discussed that in the book, but we mustn't take up our whole chat going into the details. But, but these, these things come about through knowing um, how the, the, the complicated structures of dense plasma clouds of, uh, not dense, but uh, dusty complex plasma clouds work. Fantastically complex webs, of filaments linking nodes. Uh, just, it's like an, uh, an image of the human brain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very interesting, kind of like the fractal nature of reality and how absolutely. a large scale, um, image of the universe that we can see <laughs> the observable universe at least looks very similar to a neural network. It's uh, very, very interesting. Now, I mean, fractally, you know, we have on the small scale us and then the earth cloud systems, solar systems, galaxies, universe. Do you subscribe to the idea of um, multiverse theory? Do you think there's more, more than just our universe that uh well um these uh, this idea was first floated by a man called everett who was a phd student of a man i knew called john wheeler and uh and then it was taken up by um david deutsch at oxford uh, and i in 1979 i published the first extensive report of this um having in fact, I recorded an interview with David Deutsch in which I explored what was called the many universes theory, which is uh, which has now been simplified down to be speaking of a multiverse. Yeah. The idea being that um, reality keeps splitting and that there are these different dimensions, you could call them. Uh, and and you're, you're asking me if I think that's true. Well, I don't, 
But I do believe that the plasma world and the world made of atomic matter, which we call the physical world, do go along side by side. They cohabit. And uh, and that we are all plasma beings, or what's known as bioplasma, because we're biological plasma beings, are uh, temporarily inhabiting physical bodies, which are made of atoms, but they wear out pretty fast, as we all experience every time we sprain an ankle. Right. Uh, something goes wrong and we get colds and, and and then we die so um but what does dying mean we speak of dying because we're leaving the physical world uh which has all kinds of grief and separation aspects to it which are which are terrible but it doesn't mean that we are extinct after we die we continue as plasma beings we go back to the parallel uh, plasma universe, which we can't see with our optic nerves, except a few people are very sensitive and they can see auras and so on. You know yes. about that. Yes. Uh, the more sensitive you are, the more you can perceive in that way. But they are a tiny minority of human humanity, and so um, the uh, the idea is that uh, nobody can die. It's not just that nobody does die nobody can die then you've got the problem of uh well if you can't die that means do i really have to live forever i mean is there absolutely no end to this you know <laughs> can i not escape when you think about it everybody thinks they don't want to die but then when they face the fact that they won't and can't you're faced with the problem of eternal life and what do you do with eternal life i mean where do you go uh, what's next? Uh, and the, there is only one solution to become a better and better person. Because yes. otherwise you're, you're stuck with a horrible person yourself. And you're going to be you're going to be in a state of torment caused by yourself self torment, because you're a bad person. And there's only one cure. And that's to stop being bad and be good. And then things will look up. Right, right. So the idea here is that human consciousness or the soul, whatever we want to call it, is made out of this plasma, and it's eternal. Yes. yes. And once your physical body dies, you kind of go back into this the ether or the plasma universe. Is if if we don't die, is is there obviously matter energy can't be created or destroyed? So this. It does kind of make a lot of sense. Does reincarnation kind of come into this? Can your, it's, your it's plasma fundamental. body come back and, and just recycle oh, yes. and recycle? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, reincarnation is is absolutely certain as far as I'm concerned. It's one of the few certainties that I would subscribe to. The, nothing makes any sense without reincarnation. You can't just come once mm. and then leave. Yeah. People come re uh, repeatedly. And we're... We have amnesia when we're born because it's a survival mechanism because if we didn't have amnesia, we'd be thinking about our past life the whole time and we wouldn't be aware that the big bad wolf was coming that was going to eat us all up and, and humans wouldn't have lived very long if they could spend all their time today thinking about yesterday. So we've got to start afresh and, and a lot of people think, uh, oh, this time I'm really going to, I'm going to really do it this time. I, I'm going to. I've got it together now. Uh, everybody uh, incarnates and they think, uh, well, the good people think, uh, or the people who would like to be good people think, I'm, I'm really going to be better. I'm, I'm not going to become a drug addict this time. I'm not going to become an alcoholic. I'm not going to murder anybody. I'm not going to rob banks. I'm going to be a reformed character. You just wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, and you mentioned uh, the... Or people's auras, like the the light flash and the death flash. Can you talk about how this has actually been um, more or less proven by certain techniques in recent yes. years? The birth flash, or I should say conception flash, because it's, it's what happens when the sperm meets the egg, has been filmed many times, and you can see that on YouTube. Yeah. There are several versions of it. 
So you, you can see the visual evidence of that anybody uh, by going on YouTube and, and typing in uh, conception flash or birth flash or whatever. Uh, and uh, so that's that doesn't require any dem further demonstration because it's already been filmed so often uh, that when the sperm meets and fertilizes the egg, there's a flash of light that comes out. Yeah. And similarly, um, there appears to be a flash of light when we die. But um, the... Um, the, what I, I have a, uh, an account of all this in, in my book as well. I gather together many uh, reports of the mist rising from a dying person that's been witnessed thousands of times. Yeah. Very faint mist, uh, very hard to see, and it floats upwards. And, of course, the, in the near-death experiences that we have read so often, um, people talk about floating up to the ceiling. Well, that's... Because the the mist is the, the 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 faint trace of the plasma body rising, and 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 the plasma body does rise to the ceiling. Although a lot of people are sort of forced back because it's not their time, right? But many people, many people have experienced it. I have friends who've experienced it. I, I haven't myself, but um, uh, the the there is a death flash as well. But that brings us to a discussion of what's called biophotons. So in the book, I have images that are taken in the complete darkness of, uh, of people from the, the light that spontaneously is emitted by the body by what are called biophotons, yeah. which, which are things that they come out, but you need very sensitive equipment and photomultipliers to, to, to detect them properly. But I have images, pretty spooky ones. There's a, a very spooky image of, of what a man's head and face looks like with dark holes for the eyes. But apparently biophotons aren't emitted by the eyes. And um, that's in the book. And then there are pictures of this kind that show the plasma streaming along the traditional Chinese meridians of acupuncture. And with their visual proof that the Chinese acupuncture is real and that the, the energy that the Chinese call qi is in fact plasma currents. And it's all, it's all real. It's all true. Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> Certainly, I've I've known uh, several people in my in my life that have benefited greatly from things like acupuncture uh, treatments uh, and working with with uh, that kind of those kinds of techniques. So, yeah, that's very interesting. And you see, the when you die, apparently, um, all the biophoton production of your body is concentrated. And, and it's like a light bulb that flashes before it burns out, it goes out. Uh, you get a, a, a more than 10,000 times the radiance of biophotons just as you die. It comes out of you, bang. And then it comes out at the same time as the mist that rises. Interesting. But you can't see that. You have to have detectors for the flash. Yeah. But you can see the mist. Yes, our <clears throat> our eyes are very limited in, in what we can see <laughs> in the the universe. It seems well, bumble, bumblebees see in uh, ultraviolet. You know, that's, they, that's it, true. Yeah, an ultraviolet photograph of a flower is completely different from what we see. They've got landing strips for the bees, which are invisible except in ultraviolet light. This kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, super interesting. <laughs> um, now, I wanted to to briefly touch on the subject of things like uh, UAPs, UFOs, ball lightning. Is that all kind of tied into this? Could some of the things that people are seeing in the skies be plas plasma beings potentially from the Kordaliski uh, clouds or elsewhere? Yes. yes. Um you see, plus I believe that a lot of the ball lightning uh, and a lot of the glowing of UFOs are plasmic drones, um, probably sent by the Kordaleski clouds to keep surveillance over the planet uh, at ground level. And um, we we have thousands of reports of ball lightning, and many many books have been written about that subject. And if you look into those reports, you find that there are examples. Um, of intelligent behavior by ball lightning. Uh, and, and I like to cite the example of the, the ball lightning that, that, that stopped to look at a Persian carpet and it followed the design. It was studying the design of the huh. carpet. Well, yeah. that's intelligent behavior. Right. So it's either remotely controlled in real time or it's got its, 
it's, it's got its um, plasma software on board. So it's been it's like a uh, a robotic uh, plasmic drone that's that's uh, that's programmed to study things and record them and then relay them. And I think that this explains many of the UFO sightings, the glowing ones of doing impossible speeds and zigzagging and all those things, uh, that they are, in fact, plasmic drones from the electric clouds. Yeah. We better get our thoughts together about these clouds because we have SETI programs to look for little green men on planets far, far away. But we have inorganic super intelligent life forms between us and the moon why are we wasting time on little green men when we've got the big guys right here on the same block right yeah yeah these kind of almost stewards to <laughs> the planet almost <laughs> yeah they, they, must, they must be friendly because if they weren't we wouldn't still be here yeah do you think it's possible that these super intelligences have directed human evolution over the years yes yeah it would be hard to to think otherwise yeah wow that's uh a lot of things to think about for sure <laughs> well, my book's just a story it's it's just an intro it's yeah. i i call it um uh it's basically a kindergarten text we are only <laughs> getting started with this stuff I, I have written this book to, to speak to the public because now you're speaking to uh, experts because they already know what they think. And and they're in their grooves and they don't want to challenge orthodoxy, not get a grant, not get promoted. They're in the trap of academia. And so I've written a book that's for the public because I believe the public need to put the pressure for taking this all seriously. But first they have to understand it. They have to know about it. Somebody has to tell them. There is no other book that, that tells people about the plasma universe. This is yeah. just mine. Yeah. No, I'm, I don't have any competition. I don't say that with glee. I would like there to be a hundred others, a thousand others. I would like it to become something that everybody's talking about all the time and finding out more about. So I'm trying to get it started. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, to put our plasma brains together, if you will, to... <laughs> solve this mystery for sure uh well we're just about at the the top of the hour here robert thank you uh so much for for joining me today and this has been a really fascinating and enlightening conversation uh before we we sign off uh can you tell my listeners where they can find you online where to put you, purchase your new uh book uh, along with your other works well, uh, the easiest thing to do in the States is to just um, obtain my book through Amazon. Uh, you have a choice of the the book itself. There's a hardback, there's a uh, paperback, there's an ebook, And then for people who like to listen instead of read, and there are many of them, especially if you're traveling, driving across the Nevada desert or something, <laughs> get the uh, audio book, which, which I recorded myself. It's 12 hours long. It'll, it'll take you across the Nevada desert and back again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have a, a website at all that people can go and, and check yes. out? It's, uh, it's robert-temple.com. Uh, and um, and that, that has a lot of stuff. And then if anybody wants to see my technical papers, uh, there is one about the Koleski clouds there. Uh, that was from advances in astrophysics and and many other things. They're on my entry on uh, researchgate one word dot net, and you you go to that website and type in Robert Temple, and a part it, it will it will the website will blush. <laughs> oh no, not him! But it will again then give you a list of my more technical stuff. So that's another way. But I've written lots and lots of books. You mentioned uh, The Serious Mystery. Uh, and, and I've just published a book of fiction for the first time of 55 very strange short stories. It's called The Tree's Sadness and Other Strange Stories. And um, they would appeal to you, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, 
They're, they're very, very odd, but it, they're not horror. I don't do horror, and they're not actually science fiction, although they verge on it sometimes. They're strange. They're, they're anomalistic. They're Fortean. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks again for joining me today, and uh, everyone else out there, take care of yourselves and keep it strange. Thank you again, Robert, for coming on the show today. What a truly thought-provoking theory, and this book that he has written, A New Science of Heaven, is truly fascinating. I'll link his website and where to purchase the book in my show notes. And before I sign off for this episode, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone out there listening to the show, sharing it with friends and family. It's super helpful and the Strangeology podcast wouldn't be possible or operating in the capacity that it does without the support of listeners like you. If you're looking for a way to go the extra mile and love the work I'm doing here, please check out my Patreon. You can join right now for as little as $1 a month, although the slots for that tier are getting limited and the next lowest tier will soon be the $3 tier. So definitely sign up as soon as you are able to. And depending on the tier, there's a number of benefits like social media and shout outs on the show, early access to episodes which are also ad free along with the episode extension bonus, Strangeology Beyond. You also get merch discounts at my shop, exclusive merch, and more. Also, don't forget to check out my shop if you like Cryptid and Fortean merch and want to support me that way. Summer weather is coming, so if you need new t-shirts or tank tops, you can head on over to strangeology.etsy.com. Make sure to sign up for my email list there as well for discounts. And you can also follow me on all of my socials like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube for more video content. And also, I don't say this enough, but Strangeology also has a Discord server. So if you want to continue the conversation on high strangeness and Fortiana, it's pretty easy to join. All you need to do is head on over to discord.io slash strangeology. All right, I think that is all for me for now. Robert agreed to stick around for a little while longer to talk about some other upcoming projects he has going on as well as other Fortean things out there for Strangeology Beyond. You won't want to miss it. Patrons, stick with me, and for everyone else, until next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and keep it strange. Well, that was uh, very fascinating, Robert. Thank you <laughs> so much uh, for for chatting. Um, yeah, this is a great book. I'm going to have to tell a lot of people.